The writings of Charles Darwin have had an incredible influence on the field of biology. So today we are going to step back in time and... <gasps> Charles Darwin? That's him! That's Darwin! Excuse me? Uh, who are you and how did you get here? We are um, from the future and we wondered if we could ask you a few questions. Oh, from the future and you want an interview? Well, uh, yes, uh, let me put away my writing and uh, uh, get my notes. I always take extensive notes like any good naturalist because paper never forgets. Now, um, all right, I think I'm ready for an interview from the future. <laughs> Charles Darwin, would you please tell us, did you always want to be a scientist? No, I didn't. Uh, as I was growing up, I was not very good in my studies. Uh, my father, he was in the medical profession and wanted me to be uh, a doctor as well, so he sent me to medical school, but <laughs> frankly, I got very queasy when they would perform surgeries in front of me. I did not like the sight of gore and blood. Although, I really did like taxidermy. Um, so... Then my father said, well, you need to get another job, and he enrolled me at Cambridge College to be in the clergy. Uh, I was okay at that, and so I, I eventually graduated and got a degree to be a clergyman. Uh, but one of my professors, Reverend Henslow, taught me about naturalism. I think you call it science. And I was very fascinated in that. Geology and, and beetles, I loved beetles. Um, but one does not simply did get a degree in naturalism. <laughs> Scientist is not a profession in where I grew up. So I was ready to be a clergyman when Reverend Henslow, my mentor, suggested that maybe I take a trip before I get my job as a clergyman. Uh, you know, go and see the world. So he found me uh, a ship called the HMS Beagle, which was about to travel around the world for five years, and they were looking for a resident naturalist. Someone that could collect samples of animals and plants and rocks, and also uh, keep the men, the crew on the ship, uh, occupied uh, with, with, uh, with thoughts of their mind, with intellectual thought. Because five years is a long time to go without maybe someone talking to you about all the birds and, and plants that you might be seeing. Five years is a long time. Did you enjoy sailing? Well, uh, I was very excited to go on this trip. It took me a long time to convince my father to let me go. Um, and as soon as I, but as soon as I got on the ship, um, I was very seasick. I was so sick that I didn't even leave my cabin for days. For five years while I was on this journey around the world, any time I was on the boat, unless it was the calmest of seas, I was green to my gills. But I, I did come up with a, a method for distracting my mind. I created a plankton net that I would drag behind the ship and collect sea creatures that I could study. So that helped my seasickness a little bit in order to put by doing some science. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, I will point out that the HMS Beagle, its mission was to map the coastline of South America. Now, mapping a coastline is a very, very slow and tedious job. So I did not spend a lot of my time on the ship. They would drop me off on the land and I would have the local people send, uh, take me on trips uh, throughout South America. So I was spending most of my time on land collecting rocks and bugs and, and samples of birds and animals. Uh, and spending a lot of my time doing naturalist scientist work while they were doing the tedious job of mapping. And then when they were ready to move on to another port, they would pick me up and, and, and I would move with them. Getting seasick along the way. <laughs> what were some of your favorite discoveries in South America? Oh, South America was life changing. Have you ever been? No. no, we never have. No? Well, I was dreaming about it ever since I read about it because I heard there were these lush jungles, and there are. We got to these jungles, and everything was a distraction for me. I would start watching a butterfly, and then I would see an orchid, a beautiful flower that grows out of rotting trees. And then I would see a, a monkey, and then I would see a jungle cat. And I was constantly writing down and collecting samples as fast as I could because there were so many things to see. In fact, the people on the ship, they would joke that I was collecting so much junk that it was hard to store anything in my room. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, I would pack it up in boxes and I would ship it off back to my friend, Reverend Henslow, and he would send it to other naturalists to study. So I would collect a lot of things and I would send them back. 
And one of the most uh, amazing things that I collected was I found fossils. The, these fossilized bones of giant animals. Uh, one of them was, it, it was called a megatherium, which is like a giant sloth with these elephant-like tusks. Uh, I, was, I was shown them and I excavated these fossils and sent them back to, back to England. I also found bones of a hoplophorus, which is like a giant armadillo, and a toxodon, which is kind of rhinoceros-like, and this giant camel-like maruchenia. And it got me thinking. It, it's interesting that there are different animals spread across the world, but it's also interesting that the animals have been spread across time. That there have been animals in ancient in ancient days that have died off, become extinct, and are now fossilized rocks, while there are now other animals living in our time. That is amazing. And what did, what did scientists or naturalists of your time think about this? Oh, well, there was two prevailing thoughts. Well, I should say there were two different thoughts. The prevailing thought of my time was in the literal translation of the Bible, at least in Europe, most people, including myself, believed that the Bible was very literal, that God had created all the species in the world in, in you know, one week, uh, well, six days, and then took a day to rest. Um, and so those species were created at the same time all over the world and hadn't changed, and that the world was about 6,000 years old. But there were some naturalists, including my grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who started thinking that maybe the, maybe the Earth was thousands or maybe even millions of years old, and that plants and animals had changed over time. Now, this thought was very radical in its time, and there were a lot of people resistant to that idea. Hmm. Well, did you discover evidence of actual change in your, dis in your journey? Well, yes. As we sailed around the, the coast of South America and back up, the west side of South America, we arrived at the Galapagos Islands. Have you ever heard of those places? We have. Great. They're these volcanic islands. I was very interested in the geology, but I have to admit, after exploring jungles for, for almost a year, for over a year, getting to these islands, I felt that the animals were a little drab. But like any good naturalist, I was collecting all the samples that I could. And that's where things got very interesting. You see, on the Galapagos, there are these giant tortoises, and some of my crew members would ride them like very slow horses. <laughs> but the local people pointed out to me that you could tell where a tortoise was from by the shape of its shell. What I mean is there are these separate islands in the Galapagos, and the, they could tell which island a tortoise came from by the shape of its shell. Every island had a different tortoise with a different shaped shell. Ooh. Which is very interesting that islands these close had tortoises with different shapes of shells. And also, there are these little drab birds called finches. They're little brown birds. And I'd, I'd seen many finches before. But as I collected them, I found that each island also had its own different finch. Some of them had large, long beaks. And some of them had smaller, thinner beaks. And it got me thinking, why would this small drab bird have different beaks for every separate island? Unless there was a bird, there was one finch that had migrated to the island, and then it had changed over time to adapt to the different vegetation. Because some of those islands had nuts that needed to be cracked, and so a large beak to crack nuts would be better. And, and some of the vegetation, a smaller beak, is more is is easier to get at the food. So what if the finches had changed over time to adapt to their environment? This is exactly what we've been reading about about you, your theory of evolution, this idea of descent with modification. It's so exciting to hear you describe it. <laughs> Will you tell us, tell us a little bit about Australia and what you saw in Australia? Oh yes, Australia, it's a very pleasant country with, with great weather, but I was particularly taken with its animals. Have you ever seen a platypus? We have. <laughs> Isn't it fascinating? They're amazing. It's, it's got a duck-like bill and webbed feet and lays eggs, but it also has like beaver-like fur. And, and then there also there are, there are kangaroo rats, all kinds of very interesting animals. Now, 
Europeans had been in Australia for many years, so a lot of my colleagues had already known of these animals, but it got me thinking, because as I was observing them, the platypus reminded me of the water rat in England. It served the same ecological function. And the kangaroo rat of Australia served the same ecological function of a rabbit back in England. And so I was thinking, if the Earth was created in just a few days, and each species was placed, why would our creator make two different species serving the same ecological function in different parts of the world? Why not create just this, a rabbit in both places? Or why not create a platypus in both places? Why create different species to do different things? Unless the earth was much older than we had thought and animals had evolved over time. Now I say that as if there's a conscious thought, but my theory of evolution is that it's more accidental because you know how two parents give birth to a child and that child is a little different from its parents. And then that child will eventually have its own child that's a little different and a little different and a little different. But along the way, uh, botanists have noted this, that there are different, there's mutations as if there's the, the child has a different change that that is is a radical change from its parents and what if that mutation was advantageous like a large beak to crack a nut then that child's trait would be passed on and passed on and passed on and that would become the dominant trait but say it had a beak that was too small to crack a nut then that trait would just die off so it's more accidental my theory of how animals change over time We've read about this as well. We call it natural selection. <laughs> wow, that is a very interesting way to put it. Uh, do you mind if I write that down? Um, actually, uh, <laughs> you kind of interrupted me. I'm in the middle of writing a book right now. What, what book are you writing? Uh, it's called The Origin of Species. That's the title I'm thinking of. Oh, That's so cool. Keep, keep, keep working on that. I, I have a good feeling about that book. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Uh, it's, it's, it's about this, this theory, I, I'm thinking of calling it evolution, that plants and animals change over time. Now, people have thought of this idea, but like I said, it's very radical in my day, so I want to make sure that I have the science very well studied. I'm thinking it's going to take about 25 years of, of collecting enough evidence in order to support my theory. So uh, if you don't mind, I've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> but. It was very nice of you to visit from the future. <laughs> oh, thank you, Charles Darwin, for taking the time to talk with us. Well, thank you. I hope you have a great time in the future. <laughs> Ta-ta. Bye-bye. Bye. That was so cool having Darwin. That was amazing. We hope you enjoyed this interview with Darwin and gained a little more appreciation for who he was. We want to give a big thank you to Sadie and Ricky from Math Theater. They use live theater to inspire excitement about math and science and have wonderful presentations on historical figures like Madame Curie, Galileo, and many others. Their website has an on-demand storytelling series perfect for elementary school, a history science theater podcast, music albums, study guides, and more. They also make pretty fabulous short videos on TikTok. Check out this true story about Darwin. A dramatic true story about naturalist Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin was out for a walk when he spied a beetle he had never seen before. Now quite the avid fan of beetles, this made Charles' day until he saw a second beetle, the likes of which he had also never seen before. Oh joy, two beetles. But fortune had only begun to smile upon our friend because soon he spotted a third beetle along with a dilemma. With both hands full, our friend must use his head, quite literally. He popped a beetle in his mouth to free up his hand to pick up yet a third beetle. And all was well for our friend, naturalist Charles Darwin. Until a biological response occurred on the part of the second beetle, which disgorged an acrid plume of self-defense directly into the mouth of Charles Darwin. His biological response, disgust, left him with no beetles. Possibly one beetle, but definitely not three. Oh, beetles. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's my favorite Darwin story for certain. If you'd like to explore Darwin's work further, check out our biology class. You can also put together your own miniature model of the journey of the HMS Beagle. There's a free template in the description of this video. Thanks for watching.